Knowing what to do when nature the mother throws you a curveball that tweaks a back, knee, or shoulder is a critical skill for any athlete, and especially the athlete of aging, who's trying to stay fit after 50. Today, I'm going to give you my general philosophy and approach to keeping tweaks from making you weak. I'm going to give you a smart, safe, 10-step approach to rehab minor training injuries. Hey, Gray Steel Nation, Sully here with the Barbell Prescription. Recently, we did a video on preventing training injuries, and you all seem to like it. But it's a fact of life that athletes sometimes get injured, because everybody gets injured. Sprains, strains, tweaks, and tears, part of life, whether you're active or sedentary. They're part of the training lifestyle, where you're tweaked but strong, and also part of the sedentary lifestyle, where you're tweaked and weak. My personal predilections are toward the former scenario, and my athletes and I are able to stay strong in the face of occasional tweaks and sprains by following a safe, simple approach to injury rehab. Now, this is for minor injuries. The training approach to a major injury, like the O'Donohue's terrible triad of the knee or a fractured elbow, is totally different and really simple because A, these kinds of injuries don't happen in the gym unless you do something really stupid, and B, we don't have to think about your squat form or loading if your knee is blown out or what kind of bench variant to assign a foobar elbow. You're not gonna be training. And with such injuries, the physician's hand is forced as well. The more serious the injury or the illness, the fewer options on the decision tree. But minor injuries are a different story. In these cases, training can usually continue. And the question is, how? There is no answer out there. The answer is one that you derive and tailor to your unique situation and your unique injury. Working with your doctor or your physical therapist or maybe just your coach, or maybe on your own if you have no coach, which would be sad. Now this idea that you individualize your approach to recovery from a training injury is one of the golden threads that run through this entire video. The other golden thread is, don't be dumb. You have to ask yourself the big question. And the big question is, should you train with this injury? Well, there are red flags associated with some injuries that mandate medical evaluation and treatment. And when these red flags are present, there's nothing else to think about until a physician has put eyeballs on you. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to know what they are. They're all common sense, but common sense isn't always common, so here they are. Swelling, discoloration, Echemosis or bruising, severe pain, numbness, tingling or dizziness, loss of function, deformity, instability, and systemic symptoms like nausea, shortness of breath, and so on. Stuff like this does not indicate a minor injury. It makes the rest of this video completely irrelevant and there's really nothing to talk about. Stuff like this means a trip to the doctor, and the last five should prompt consideration of an ER or urgent care visit. Red flags trump everything else. If you have one, stop and get thee to a doctor. One final matter before we really dig in. Muscle belly tears are sort of their own thing. Well, muscle belly tears happen while you're exercising, and you know it when it happens. There's a ripping pain in the muscle belly, which is not at the origin or the insertion, the ends of the muscle, but in the middle. And it's accompanied by the early appearance of ecchymosis or bruising. You'll get stiffness and possibly swelling. And yes, muscle belly tears are injuries, and yes, they hurt and they require rehab. But the approach is a little different than what I'm presenting here, which is more about back, joint, tendon, and ligament tweaks, and minor muscle strains and sprains without actual rippage. With all of that said, let's get to my 10-step approach to tweaks. Step one, be smart. If you are injured while training, stop. Alert your coach and evaluate. Look for the red flags, swelling, deformity, discoloration, numbness, tingling, loss of function, systemic complaints, or instability. If your pain is severe and debilitating and or associated with any red flags at all, stop. Workout's over get it checked out by a healthcare professional. If your pain is minor and transient, do the movement without loading, that is, without a bar. If that doesn't hurt, 
try the empty bar or a very light bar. If that also doesn't hurt, try a single, double, or triple at no more than 50% of working weight. If these do not hurt, stop. You're still done training for the day, but you can try resuming cautiously in the next session. If any of those do hurt, stop and evaluate further. If you have red flags or worsening pain, the workout is over and it's time to get checked out. Don't be dumb. But if you don't have any of these warning signs, move on to the next exercise, starting unloaded with an empty bar or even without the bar, pantomiming the exercise and working your way up carefully. This is no time to jump warm-ups or go for a PR. And if that exercise goes well, repeat with the next one. If you can't move on with other lifts, abort the workout and strongly consider evaluation. People go to the doctor for a lot less, believe me. Rest, but remain mobile, walking and stretching and so on. And use analgesics, wraps, supports, cold and warm, whatever makes it feel better, short of Maker's Mark, Oxy or Street Fentanyl. More on the stuff in a minute. In the meantime, I'd like to hear your thoughts. What, if anything, do you use for acute musculoskeletal pain? And why? Share with us in the comments. In summary, do not ignore severe pain, deformity, dysfunction, or other red flags. Be judicious and err on the side of caution. Seek evaluation if you even think you may need it. Step two, keep moving. This is so important. Keep moving so that your injury heals in a way that keeps it supple and ready for training. Going to ground and taking huge chunks of time off is the worst thing that you can do with a tweak. Unless your condition progresses to a red flag situation, return to the gym for your next workout. Even if it's just a walk around and push the sled. When you get there, repeat the evaluation steps. Look for red flags or worsening symptoms. If you now find a red flag, get it looked at ASAP. If you find that it's all better and you can train without discomfort or stiffness or spontaneous decapitation, then train, move on. You dodged a bullet. But even if you're still tweaked, don't go sessile after the acute phase while you wait for it to heal. If you stop moving, you will heal, but you may heal with scarring and shortening that will plague your training in the long term. Remember, immobility is injury. If you're still stiff or hurting, but again, you're not in a red flag situation, it's time to revise your program while you heal up, while staying as strong and fit as possible. That's steps three through 10. Step three, find out what you can do and do it. Now, if you can perform the movement pattern with the unloaded bar with a minimum of discomfort, titrate up slowly with triples, doubles, and singles. Find the weight you can do for a single with just slight discomfort and then stop. Take off 20% and do a set of three. Then take 20% off of that and do two sets of five. So for example, here I'm training with a back tweak that affects my deadlift. I warm up carefully and in small jumps to a single at 345 that's just starting to hurt. I stop there and deload by 20% to 275 and do a triple. This doesn't hurt at all and feels way too light, but that's fine. Then I take off another 20%, which I round up a bit to 225, and then I do two sets of five. Again, they feel too light, but this is productive rehab work. Or let's take my client, Janet. She's 71 years old and she's dealing with a proximal adductor tweak. There's no tear, but it hurts. And she can usually put up a squat single of about 125 or so. Today, she warms up with air squats and then empty bar, progressing to a single at 90 pounds that just starts to annoy her injury. Then she takes off about 20% and does a triple at 75. Then she deloads again to 60 for two sets of five. They feel really light to her, but her focus is not on weight, but on tightness and slow, precise movement. Now, after this 135 pattern, you are done with that exercise for today. If you wish, and your coach really thinks it's prudent, you can supplement with variants or accessory movements that can be loaded heavier, as discussed next. If you cannot perform the standard movement pattern with the unloaded bar or very light weights with a minimum of discomfort, you're suspending that exercise for the short term. It's time to explore variants and accessory movements. That's step four. Step four, emphasize substitute movements. In a lot of ways, this is the guts of it. So we're gonna spend a bit of time here. 
You're going to use variants and accessory movements that do not aggravate the injury and train them. Ideally, you'll select these movements with guidance from your coach and or a cool physical therapist. In selecting these movement patterns, keep a few guidelines in mind. First, do not stop using the injured part after the acute phase. Again, assuming no red flags. Remember, we're trying to keep the tweaked structure in the game so it heals for training, not for immobility. Second, do not continue painful movement patterns. Drop them and replace them with something else. Third, select movement patterns that are not uncomfortable or less uncomfortable. Our philosophy is not to train through pain, but to train around pain. Fourth, don't go crazy. Use the smallest number of accessory movements necessary. Your focus remains on the prime movements to the extent that you can train them. So what do we mean by all this? Well, we can't be exhaustive, but there are all kinds of variants that you can use while you're rehabbing a tweak. You can do this by exercise or by body region. So, for example, squats can be rehabbed by partially or completely replacing them with high bar squats, box squats, partial squats, safety bar squats, goblet squats, leg presses, front squats, good mornings, and so on. The overhead press can be rehabbed with incline benches, rack presses, pin presses, curls, dumbbell presses, and the like. Bench presses can take a break while you do dumbbell bench presses, push-ups, narrow grip bench, more presses, and so on. But here's an important tip for both bench and press. Whatever variant you use, make sure you do not have a barbell raised on unlocked wrists or elbows. That's dangerous and cannot be permitted. If your deadlift is painful, try using halting deads, rack pulls, Romanian deadlifts, straight leg deadlifts, good mornings, rows, chins, pull-ups, and lat pull-downs. I prefer to rehab tweaks by thinking about movement patterns more than anatomical structures or body regions, but partial squats, box squats, and good mornings are helpful for knee tweaks. Some people prescribe lunges and leg extensions as well, although I don't use them so much. Wide grip bench favors elbows, as do pin presses, chins, dumbbell benches, and so on. Whatever feels best and lets you train. Low back gets a break from squat variants we discussed a minute ago, extra conditioning, or the leg press. With the upper back, you can experiment with the same variants we listed for a tweaky bench and press. But you gotta be careful. Often, upper back is not musculoskeletal, but neck or neuro-based. So have a low threshold for medical evaluation. Again, you want to keep the number of replacement exercises to a minimum. Use the two or three at most that allow you to move the heaviest loading with the least discomfort. And it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. If you have a low impact, low intensity movement discipline like Tai Chi or swimming that you can adapt and employ in your rehab, absolutely, I love it. Go for it. And while you're going for it, give us a like if you're finding this information useful. That really helps us help more people. Step five, use medium intensity and lowish volume. This is a good general prescription for joint, ligament, tendon, and low back tweaks. I find that these structures don't like high volume work when old and injured, and sometimes even when they're not injured in later decades. They won't benefit from big volume while healing. Now, again, for muscle belly tears, you've actually fallen out of the scope of this video. Most people think that's a job for the STAR rehab, although this approach is more controversial than it used to be. I've seen it work a lot though, so I stay with it. That's daily, high volume, very low intensity sets that encourage the muscle to heal with a minimum of scar tissue. You can learn more about the STAR and the controversy surrounding it by asking Professor Google. We'll do a video on it someday if y'all ask us to. Share your thoughts and experiences about the STAR and muscle belly tears in the comments. We wanna hear from you. But for non-muscle belly tears, for mechanical low back pain, ligament, joint, and tendon tweaks, I like the low volume, medium intensity, one, three, five method that I gave you in step three. Titrate up to a single, knock off 20% for a triple, and knock off 20% of that for one or two sets of five. This approach keeps you away from very high intensities or volumes while forcing the injury to work in the mid range. I find that it works really well and gets people back to working weight sooner than any other approach I've seen. Step six, advance, but slowly. Once you've established your temporary pattern of training with injury, with careful consideration of which movements to train and which to substitute, 
you can advance. Painless exercises can be advanced just as they were according to whatever program you were using before. The movements that you're rehabbing can be advanced slowly. And the way I do this is by trying to get an index single that's just a little bit heavier than the one I did last time. So if I'm doing 135 on the squat and this week I got 175 for a single, I might try for 177.5 or 180 next time. For the upper body movements, I might make smaller jumps. There's no cookie cutter approach here. You have to be smart and judicious, or have a coach, or both. And this is terribly important. If you can't make progress, if that single hurts at that same weight every time and you just can't go past it, it's time for medical and or coaching consultation. Sometimes you just have to get help. And this is one of those times. Step seven, emphasize your conditioning while you heal. Well, this is a good time to work on your metabolic and cardiorespiratory conditioning with a tolerated modality. A little extra time with the prowler or the bike to nowhere will keep you feeling productive and help maintain a degree of energy utilization and fitness while you're nursing a tweak. That's huge for your fitness and your mental health. Step eight, make it feel better. Use analgesics, thermal therapy, and supports aggressively while you rehab. Seriously, stoic is not synonymous with stupid. Tylenol and an NSAID have been my go-to cocktail for mild to moderate pain for 30 years, for my ER patients, for myself, and for my athletes. If you've heard somebody in the gym or the interwebs tell you that these medicines will blunt your gains, you need to put in your earbuds and crank up some nice tunes while you take your Tylenol and your Motrin because they don't know that. The data on this is all over the place and work by investigators like Trapp et al. has demonstrated the opposite is true for older populations. Older trainees get back in the gym, back on the platform, back on the trail, back under the bar sooner when their pain and inflammation is controlled. Occasional short-term use of over-the-counter analgesics provided you and your doctor agree they're safe for you, it's not going to hamper your program. Likewise, the data on heat and cold is incoherent in aggregate. My advice? Use it if it feels good. Wraps and straps to support injured structures are essential for confidence and prevention of re-injury. Use them liberally, and if you don't know how, ask your coach to show you. And let us know in the comments if you'd like a video on that, and we'll get to work on it. Oh, and if you're worried that analgesics will allow you to work in a range that will worsen your injury, don't be. I do not see this. If your back or your shoulder doesn't like training with an injury, you're not going to like it on Tylenol any better. These over-the-counter medicines are analgesics, not anesthetics. Bottom line, if you're injured and training with discomfort and your coach tells you not to use over-the-counter analgesics, supports, or thermotherapy, you need to fire your coach. If it makes you feel better and decreases the pain and improves the function, it's good. Do it. Remember, after the acute phase, pain does nothing good for you and can be its own problem if you let it take root. Keep your pain on a short leash. Step nine. Remember that you are an individual, and so is your injury. Approaches will be similar, but not identical for two athletes with a back injury, because no two back injuries are really the same. This whole video, I hope, is giving you the idea that you are tailoring your rehab to your injury, your capacities, your resources, your discomfort. Find out what works for you with this injury and do that. So this is a general approach. And as detailed as it may seem, it's actually more cookie cutter than we'd like because it has to be. The ideal situation is one in which you have a coach and either a sports med doc who's hip to what you do or a physical therapist in the know working together on specific diagnosis and rehab approach. Of course, this is where it helps to have a coach and to know a physical therapist or a doc who understands what we do. Maybe you don't need to wait until you have an injury to find these guys. Something to think about. For the moment though, most people don't have a team like that. And this general approach will get you through a lot of minor sprains and strains. But I can't emphasize enough. If your discomfort is persistent, or if it's getting worse, spreading, putting up red flags, or leading to emotional or systemic distress, it's time to up the ante and get thee to a professional at once. 
Barring that, you can go a long way toward training around injuries with this overall adaptable approach. Be smart, keep moving, find out what you can do and do it, employ substitute movements, use moderate intensity and lowish volume, advance judiciously, emphasize your conditioning, make it feel better, and remember that you are an individual with an individual issue. If you have hacks and tried and true tricks that get you through minor tweaks, please share them. We want to hear from you and learn from you. What's that you say? Oh, we haven't done number 10. Well, number 10 is different, you see. Numbers one through nine are all positive actions that you can take to get yourself through a minor injury and get back to training. But number 10 is not so much a way of acting as a way of thinking. Step 10, rehab your mind. Our mindset affects how we perceive discomfort, how we function, how we train, and how we heal. You may find yourself thinking that your back or your neck tweak or your ligament sprain or your jacked up wrist or your aggravated knee is the beginning of atrophy, the end of everything, the harbinger of a long decline into disability and death, the rock upon which your ship of training has finally run aground. About the end of the world, and now it looks like it may actually happen. So be good, for goodness sake. Whoa, somebody's we coming. We have to get out of here. That's not going to help. This kind of thinking, which we call catastrophizing, is just going to make things worse. It's going to worsen your pain, slow your healing, keep you out of the gym, make you grumpy, exacerbate your inflammation, and drive you into the waiting arms of a three-week-long pizza and whiskey bender. Ask me how I know. No, don't go there. Steps one through nine are how to discipline your body while you're tweaked. Step 10 is to rehab your mind. Stay calm, keep your thoughts positive and productive, and know that this is temporary. Here's a little mantra I use. I am an athlete. I am not broken. I just have a minor training injury. All athletes get injured. My injury is healing. I am continuing to train. This experience will make me a better athlete, wiser, smarter, stronger, and more courageous. This too shall pass. It will, you know, it will pass. And the experience of training through it won't just make you a better athlete, but a better human being, because life is always throwing us curveballs in and out of the gym. And because life, after all, is just a metaphor for training.